So today I'm going to talk about the Optimod 8685 surround audio processor. And uh, to start with, I'm going to uh, review a few things about loudness control and make some general observations. Experience has shown that the mass television audience wants two things from television audio. Dialogue should be comfortably intelligible, and commercials should not be irritatingly loud compared to program material. Uh, the FCC now requires this by law uh, with the COM Act. There are two main approaches to COM Act compliance. Uh, one is file-based static loudness adjustment based on long-term BS 1770 loudness measurement. And the other is online real-time loudness control, like that provided by Warband's processors. Home theater owners may want the opportunity to watch feature films while hearing a wide dynamic range signal. However, even these viewers usually consume television in a much more passive way when viewing garden variety programs. To be an acceptable part of the domestic environment, television sound cannot overwhelm household members not interested in viewing, not to mention neighbors, particularly in multifamily dwellings. For a variety of reasons, the dynamic range of sound essential to the intelligibility of the program should not exceed 15 dB in a domestic listening environment. Underscoring and ambient sound effects will, of course, be lower than this. In typical analog uh, television practice, all audio is applied to a single transmission audio processor that automatically controls the average modulation and the peak to average ratio while smoothing out transitions between program elements. Simple compression and peak limiting can't do this effectively. Starting with the 8182 in 1982, all Optimod TV processors have incorporated the CBS loudness controller. This technology has seen 40 years of continuous improvement, first by CBS Labs, later CBS Technology Center, and then finally by Warband. In ITU parlance, the CBS loudness controller relies on a so-called short-term loudness measurement that takes into account the human ear's loudness integration time, which is approximately 200 milliseconds. The CBS algorithm's attack time is fast enough to prevent audible and irritating loudness overshoots, that is, short-duration blasts of sound, that have viewers scrambling for their remote controls. Unlike long-term loudness measurement and control technologies, the CBS loudness controller recognizes that a piece of program material whose average loudness seems acceptable according to a long-term loudness measurement may nevertheless have short sections whose loudness should be reduced because it's extremely annoying. Static file-based loudness control can't deal with irritating short-term loudness events, uh, nor can it really uh, deal with the uh, transitions between program elements. So I'm going to show you some measurements. Uh, this is about a half an hour of unprocessed audio from uh, Channel 7's master control switcher output a number of years ago uh, here in San Francisco. Uh, the measurement uh, instrument was the CVS loudness meter for these. And you can see that there's a fairly large uh, loudness variation, certainly to the point where people would find it annoying. And you can see the uh, commercial break uh, right up here, which is louder than anything else. So let's put that through a audio processor consisting of a two-band compressor plus CBS loudness controller. Uh, and you can see that the loudness is much better controlled. Uh, the uh, vertical axis is expanded here so that it's uh, 0 to minus 5 dB. And everything is within a comfortable window. So what did the loudness controller do for you? Well, we can overlay the original measurements uh, in red. and the output of the loudness controller in blue. And you can see that mostly the loudness controller brought up the low level material so that it was about the same loudness as the commercial break. But what about the uh, BS1770 loudness meter, which is the basis for ATSC recommendation A85 
and the FCC rule implementing the COM Act. Wasn't this supposed to fix loudness problems once and for all? Well, um, we can look at the uh, same measurement as I showed you before, but instead of using the CBS meter, uh, we're going to use the BS 1770 algorithm. And you can see that uh, it's still very nicely controlled. Uh, the uh, vertical axis is very much uh, expanded here. And we can also look at this in terms of a histogram. A histogram is basically a probability density function. Uh, it shows the uh, number of uh, loudness uh, measurements falling within a given bin. Uh, it's about a quarter of an LU wide here. And you can see that uh, for a target loudness of minus 18, uh, things are very tightly clustered. Uh, they're certainly well within the ATSC A85 comfort zone, which is plus 2 to minus 5 dB. So um, let me quote from A85. Because loudness is a subjective phenomenon, human hearing is the best judge of loudness. When combined with a known mixing environment, such as that described in Section 10 of this recommended practice, experienced audio mixers using their sense of hearing could produce well-balanced program sound with remarkably consistent loudness. Uh, ATSC A85 says that the so-called anchor elements should be consistent from source to source. Uh, and of course, A85 applies only to uh, commercial program material, uh, spot announcements, promos, etc. But it's certainly a good idea to hold your program content to the same consistent loudness as the commercials. But the BS 1770 meter has problems distinguishing so-called anchor elements, uh, for example, dialogue, from dialogue plus underscoring or dialogue plus effects. Now this is a uh, graph taken right from the BS 1770 standard itself. Uh, this shows the difference between loudness as reported by a panel of human listeners, that is the subjective loudness here on the x-axis, and the objective loudness as indicated by the meter. And we can see that there are some fairly big outliers here, uh, as much as 6 dB, 5 dB. Um, and in fact, to deal with this one, we would really have to move the uh, trend line down just a little bit so that we would fit within the comfort zone. So BS 1770, better than nothing, but can't replace human judgment. If the meter disagrees with your ears, you should certainly trust your ears. Meanwhile, some Hollywood post-production mixers are reporting problems with rigid network QC standards that rely solely on the 1770 meter. Uh, for example, um, a gentleman calling himself Postman uh, said this, when I said loudness meters lie, I mean that what sounds equally loud to my ear may not be the same to the meter. For instance, a section of narration without music might measure something like minus 25 or minus 26 if there are lots of spaces. A section of archive sound like the calls of a sports game commentator with crowd roaring will easily read minus 22 or even higher for what sounds like the same volume to my ear. So, if there's a loudness range expectation that would be part of a quality control measurement, then I'm forced to mix badly and make meters read correctly or I need to be prepared to deal with the consequences later. By the way, I have had this exact problem be the reason a mix was bounced by QC. I had kept the volume down to make the meter read within the allowed range, and this was a spec that said all sections of their show had to be within the same narrow range. I did not have the luxury of measuring only the full show duration. The client complained about it, and rightly so. We made the mix more correct and got tapped by the QC report. So as I said, the meter lies. If one has the added burden of narrow loudness range, as I have had in the past, that I fear will continue in the future, uh, one finds himself in a quandary. And the uh, colorfully named Where's My Froggy chimed in, 
saying I would like to uh, back up Postman on faulty meter readings with this example. I did a minus 24 piece for Fox that was wall to wall singing in music for two minutes. Because of the overall loudness and continued full audio signal, I had to bring it down. And when it aired, it was 3 dB too quiet, even though it matched the magic LKFS number. I have no problems using these meters or meeting specs, but they're faulty. So, in 2015, we found a way forward. The Audio Engineering Society recognized the concept of genre in the context of 1770. Uh, specifically, their recommendation for loudness of audio streaming and network file playback uh, takes genre into account for the first time. And quoting from the recommendation, within a given program, the largest perceived difference to be noted is speech versus music. Speech normalized to the same integrated loudness as a music stream inevitably sounds too loud. It is recommended to normalize speech, that is, dialogue segments, within other segments, two to four LU or more below the loudness of the other segments, end quote. So, other suggestions. Take AA85's prime directive seriously. Because loudness is a subjective phenomenon, human hearing is the best judge of loudness. Relying solely on 1770 without listening is a recipe for substandard source-to-source -source consistency. Dense material will usually be quieter than unadorned dialogue. Dialogue levels will vary depending on the amount of underscoring and or effects in the track. And errors of up to 3 dB are common and appear frequently with typical broadcast program material. When your ears disagree with the 1770 meter, trust your ears. You probably have a genre problem. Our politically incorrect conclusion, which is based on many, many hours of listening and processor development, is trust the CBS loudness controller in the Optimod. Because of its 200 millisecond integration time, it's highly effective in honing in on dialogue, even in the presence of underscoring and effects. It uses a more sophisticated psychoacoustic model than 1770. Unlike 1770, the CBS loudness controller models loudness summation. Uh, what is that? As a given amount of RMS acoustic power is spread out over a wider bandwidth, it will sound louder. And this is a well-established principle in psychoacoustics. It also takes into account LFE energy. Uh, BS 1770 specifically excludes the LFE channel because the K-weighting curve fails miserably on this material, making subjective errors as large as 10 dB when you compare with human listeners. For organizations requiring automated loudness qualification of ingested material, our processors provide a defeatable so-called BS 1770 safety limiter. Located after the CBS loudness controller, the 1770 safety limiter constrains the reading of the 1770 meter to a preset threshold, which we allow you to set anywhere from 0 to a plus 6 LU with respect to dial norm. The limiter's 10-second attack time minimizes but can't eliminate loudness ducking on material with low peak to RMS ratio. Loudness ducking is an inevitable side effect of relying on the 1770 algorithm to estimate the loudness of such material without considering genre. The limiter's three-second release time prevents dialogue that follows a loud commercial from being too quiet for an annoying length of time. So I recommend using the 1770 safety limiter only if meter reading is more important than achieving the best subjective source-to-source -source consistency of the anchor element, uh, because the CBS algorithm simply takes genre into account automatically better than 1770 does. So let me show you some measurements comparing uh, what happens when you have the safety limiter on and off. The uh, slide you're seeing here is a uh, histogram, again, of a different piece of program material than we looked at last time as loudness controlled by a Orban processor. And this is a BS1770-2 measurement. We can see that there is one 
little uh, bar here at about minus 21.7. Uh, so this is arguably slightly outside the comfort zone. Then we have this big one here at about minus 22.3. Okay, same measurement, but with the 1770 safety limiter on, we see that the uh, little outlier here at minus uh, 21.7 goes away, and almost nothing happens here at minus 22.3. And... The safety limiter really doesn't affect the stuff down here clustered around the target loudness. So, what to do? The CBS loudness meter, uh, which is also known as the Jones and Torek loudness meter after its creators and loudness controllers based on it, tend to lock onto dialogue and take genre into account automatically. The 1770 meter indicates the approximate overall loudness of the program, although it tends to overread material with a low peak to RMS ratio. If dialogue levels are held constant, the 1770 meter will indicate the dialogue mixed with underscoring or effects is louder than unadorned dialogue, even though the dialogue levels haven't changed. The 1770 short term measurement, which is a three second integration time with no gating, is particularly prone to this behavior and shouldn't be used as the sole reference for an automatic loudness controller. Automatic loudness control is unlikely to ever be as good as a human mixer when the most aesthetically pleasing results are desired because only humans can understand the subtleties of context. Cascading a CBS loudness controller and a PS1770 overshoot limiter is often a good compromise. The CBS controller prevents unadored dialogue from being unnaturally pumped up in loudness, while the 1770 controller catches material whose overall loudness might be considered excessive, depending on the loudness control philosophy of the broadcaster. As we said earlier, pile-based loudness control is more likely than online loudness control to create loudness inconsistencies at the boundaries between program elements. It's a different way of doing things. It's fairly easy, but it doesn't necessarily give you the best subjective results. So let's uh, look more generally at loudness control going beyond CBS and BS1770 to look at the uh, rest of the processing in the Optimod loudness controllers. What can go wrong? A poorly designed automatic loudness controller can cause many undesirable side effects. Uh, some of these include noise breathing, gain pumping and ducking, harsh sounding spitty dialogue caused by inappropriate multiband compression, compromised dialogue intelligibility, inconsistent dialogue levels, changing with effects and underscoring, and stereo image shifts. And I've heard a fair amount of this stuff on the air in the last couple of years. While the main purpose of loudness control processing is to control the loudness of commercials, other exuberantly mixed elements can also benefit. Examples are gunshots and applause with whistling. An important feature that our Optimod 8685 has is our proprietary Optimix Stereo to 5.1 up mixer. This is an in-house design by me and Greg Oganowski, and it comes standard with all 8685s. It provides convincing stereo to surround up mixing that is subjectively indistinguishable from real 5.1 material. It automatically detects whether the input is stereo or 5.1, and up mixes any stereo material to 5.1 without switching glitches. Dialogue stays solidly in the center, even in the most complex mixes. Unlike up mixers derived from consumer algorithms, there is no directional pumping of elements in the surround sound field. Extremely robust automatic phase skew delay correction uh, ensures a crisp center channel free from comb filtering, even from material originally stored on analog tape. Uh, it has excellent stereo and mono downmix capability. Material that doesn't need phase correction 
down mixes to the original 2.0 input. Uh, you just need to tell Optimix what Dolby Digital downmix metadata coefficients you're transmitting. And these are the uh, gain uh, adjustments for the uh, various surround channels when they are summed into stereo, and it's, it's part of the Dolby Digital metadata. When active, the phase corrector makes mono and stereo downmixes sound better than the original 2.0 input. So let's look uh, in more detail at the 8685. Uh, it provides the function and control necessary for up to eight channels of surround uh, simultaneously, while also offering four stereo processors, each with its own loudness controller and meters. The 8685 offers two-band and five-band audio processing for surround sound broadcasting and netcasting. Thanks to compression ratio controls and a mastering quality look-ahead peak limiter, the 8685 is also suitable for mastering audio in broadcast productions, as well as productions intended for media such as DVD and Blu-ray. All processors have independent CBS loudness controllers and BS 1770 safety limiters. The oversampled peak limiters are so-called true peak aware, so they prevent overshoot and clipping at the output of the receiver's digital to analog converter. The output exhibits no overshoot when measured by true peak meters complying with the uh, BS 1770 Annex 2. Everybody knows BS 1770 because of the loudness measurement part of it, but they also explain how to make a true peak meter by oversampling the side chain of a ordinary peak reading meter. Built-in CBS and BS 1770-2 loudness meters indicate the subjective loudness of the surround and the 2.0 channel processing. The 8685 is dial norm aware, and it can reauthor if metadata is needed. A pass-through mode passes both audio and metadata through without modification. It's useful when transmitting network-originated material whose loudness is known to have been correctly controlled upstream. Toggling between pass-through and processing modes is a smooth crossfade. The 8685's multi-channel and stereo processors can operate with separate audio processing parameters like release times. For example, the stereo processing could be set up for relatively heavy processing to make a newsroom feed more consistent, while the main processing was set up more conservatively to correct network material and commercials unobtrusively. Because each of the stereo processors has its own loudness controller and true peak limiters, another important application is processing subchannels in digital television. Each 2.0 processor can operate in dual mono mode with independent loudness control and metering on each mono channel. Video description processing is one interesting application of one of the stereo processors. You can uh, drive it with the video descriptor channel, and built-in silence sense can substitute a down mix of the surround processing when the video description is silent at the processor's input. This provides a fail-safe to prevent the video description channel from going silent. To minimize latency and to achieve highest reliability, the 8685 uses a dual hardware architecture. Freescale 24-bit DSP chips do all audio processing, while a separate microcontroller supports the GUI and control functions. Thanks to this partitioning, even if the control microprocessor malfunctions, the 8685 will continue to process audio normally. Onboard Dolby AC3 encoding is optionally available. It's a Dolby manufactured module that plugs into the 8685's uh, input-output board. Minimum latency of the fully processed signal is 33 milliseconds, which can be padded to exactly one frame of delay for any video standard. The SDI signal path provides up to 11 frames of video delay to retain AV sync. This is particularly useful with Optimax upmixing, which has five frames of delay, and Dolby Digital encoding, which has 187 milliseconds of delay. So let's look at the input output. 3G HD SDI IO supports all common HD and SD standards. Four AES 3ID inputs and three outputs are included. 
They can be used for the stereo processing channels if these aren't carried on the SDI. The 8685's inputs and outputs, uh, SDI, AS3 ID, and optionally Dolby E, are highly configurable by a remote controllable internal routing switches with scene memory for easy recall. The 8685 can be remote controlled by HGPI ports by its RS-232 serial port using a modem or direct cable connection to a computer and via Ethernet. Included PC remote software for Windows allows the user to access all 8685 features and allows the user to archive and restore presets, automation lists, and system setups. An easy-to-use API provides remote administration over TCP IP via the RS-232 serial or Ethernet ports. SNMP support allows monitoring of the unit's operation through standard SNMP clients on your LAN. Many of you probably already have SNMP networks. It's extremely well adapted and very, very useful. The 8685 hosts the TCP IP terminal server to allow external control of the 8685 from either a Telnet SSH client or a custom third-party application. All API commands are simple text strings. Dual power supplies include independent line connections and automatic switchover in the event that one supply fails. A stereo headphone jack is available on the front panel. Useful for system troubleshooting, it can be configured to emit any 8685 output signal and is independent of the stereo analog monitor output. So how do you control it? Well, for most applications, the factory presets are just fine. We have, I believe, around 10 presets available for different types of television audio, but the general purpose preset works quite well with all program material. And if you want to customize a preset beyond that, there's three levels. Less more control affects only dynamics processing. It's user friendly. Uh, it allows you to access the equalization controls. It's fast, easy, and safe. Then there's an intermediate level, which I'm not going to show you a picture of. And at advanced modify, all controls are available, but it requires lengthy adjustment and listen cycles. It's intended for power users. It requires serious audio processing experience, uh, being intricate and risky, but it's extremely powerful in the right hands. In the surround processing, the center channel has independently adjustable parameters and can improve dialogue intelligibility. Basically, the center channel is its own compressor and it's loosely coupled to the remaining five channels, that is to say the uh, left and right fronts, left and right surrounds, and LFE, uh, but allowed to uh, float in a window which you can adjust and which is typically maybe plus or minus 2 to 3 dB, uh, except for band 5, uh, which allows for de-essing. The uh, nice thing about this is if the dialogue is too quiet, uh, the center channel will automatically uh, bring it up. And at the same time, if it's muddy, uh, it will automatically equalize it for better intelligibility. By upmixing stereo sources to 5.1, Optimix allows the dialogue in 2.0 sources to be corrected also. Uh, in the 2.0 processing, you can set many of the processing parameters separately for speech signals as detected by the 8685's automatic speech music detector. There are six levels of security. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but you can go all the way from all screens, which is the administrator level, down to a level where you can only recall processing presets. I'm going to go through this block diagram. Uh, it's probably a little hard to see, but there's a lot of stuff here. So I'm just going to start at the beginning. Here you have the uh, SDI and the AS3ID inputs going into the input routing switcher, which is programmable. That uh, can send the uh, audio to the surround routing switcher and also directly to the various stereo processors. Following the surround routing switcher, the uh, 
audio goes to a two-band window-gated AGC, which actually does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, typically, it's run anywhere from 5 to 10 dB of gain reduction. Uh, and it's just sort of a gentle hand on the fader to control incorrect levels. But the final loudness control, as you'll see, is done a little bit later in the chain. Following that is a equalizer, um, usually used lightly, uh, if at all, in television audio. Although the program adaptive high frequency enhancer can be quite useful for improving intelligibility. So following the equalizer, the signal is applied to the two band or five band compressor limiter. And typically that's run with about 3 dB of gain reduction for television audio. So at that point, we actually can take a down mix and send that back to the routing switcher and thence into one of the stereo processors. So for example, in the uh, video descriptor application that I told you about earlier, this is where you would get the uh, replacement down mix program material, which would go in the video descriptor channel when silence was detected in the video descriptor channel input. Following that down mix tap off, we have a summation point, and this allows you to send the output of one of the stereo mixers into the surround. So why would you want to do this? Well, for example, you might use one of the 2.0 processors for your newsroom. And if you wanted to uh, bypass master control for whatever reason, you could mix the newsroom right into the surround in the audio processor itself. So following the mix, it goes to the loudness controller, which I've already uh, discussed at fairly great length, consisting of the CVS controller and the BS1770 safety limiter. And at that point, the signal goes into the look ahead true peak limiter. Uh, this can also be fed from the output of the AGC. And sometimes if you have a uh, split system where some of the processing is at the studio and some is at the transmitter, you might want to do this. Peak limiter goes to the output routing switcher. Uh, and again, that is quite versatile in terms of being able to route audio uh, channels to the various uh, SDI and AS3 ID outputs, as well as the analog monitor output and headphone output. There's very little to say about the stereo processing chain that I haven't already said. Uh, it's almost identical to the surround, uh, except that you can pre-emphasize the peak limiter. And this is not really terribly relevant in US television. Uh, this feature was more in place for countries that are still simulcasting television uh, on analog FM. So they need 50 or 75 microsecond aware pre-emphasis limiting in order to control the modulation of the transmitter. So let's do some summing up here. Third generation CBS loudness controllers regulate both subjective loudness and annoyance. Uh, they help keep loudness of the anchor elements constant. And the controllers work in both two-band and five-band modes. Optimix provides seamless upmixing of stereo sources to 5.1. Phase correction and dialogue intelligibility correction improve quality compared to the original 2.0 source. RS-485 serial connections can accept and emit Dolby Digital metadata, reauthoring it as necessary. Why would you want to do this? The uh, Dolby Digital metadata has uh, the so-called dynamic range control words, which the consumer receiver can use in its so-called night mode. Different uh, manufacturers have different names for the same feature. But you really want to reauthor that DRC metadata after you've applied loudness control through the 8685 because uh, the upstream DRC metadata is no longer relevant after you have uh, done further processing. The uh, reauthoring basically tells the downstream 
Adobe Digital Encoder to reauthor the DRC metadata and to replace whatever uh, it was receiving upstream. HDSDI supports metadata transport via Adobe E and via HDSDI for SMPTE 2020-2 2008 method A or SMPTE 2020-3 2008 method B. An optional Adobe Digital Encoder is built in and it can be either ordered from the factory or field retrofitted. Built-in CBS and BS1774 loudness controllers indicate the loudness of the surround and 2.0 channel processing. And I should just add here that there's really no difference between 1770-2, which I was talking about earlier, and 1770-4. Dash 4 dash mainly added the ability to uh, take into account the newer surround formats with height like uh, Adobe Atmos and MPEG-H.